that's good to hear. I'm so glad to see y'all this morning and, and be able to share with you and be able to fellowship with you and, and be able to have a good morning with you. Are you praising, are you praising God this morning? Amen. And that's what we should be doing. And you know, we've done that. It was good to be able to, that's the first time we've shaken hands. Oh, right. Been well over a year. You know, and, years. <laughs> and two years ain't it's, been yeah, it had to have been. It had to have been at least two years, a year and a half, two years since we've done handshake. It was good to be able to meet one another and talk to one another and fellowship. I know that some people get uncomfortable. And if you are uncomfortable, that's all right. You ain't got to go and participate. Let people come around and shake your hand and tell you that you love them. Tell them they love them. That's all right. That's okay. You, you do you. You do you. And, and that's what it's about. We want to be able to encourage each other this morning and be able to fellowship this morning. And with that comes the bringing of the word and the conclusion of our Sermon on the Mount series. We have gone six months. Six months through the Sermon on the Mount. Now a lot of people would look at that and say, why? Why would you go and just do all that for this? Because in my opinion, and doing the study of the Sermon on the Mount that I did last year as I built up to this, one of the things I said is this is something the church needs. And I think it's something not just the church needs, but every single individual within the church needs. And today is going to explain exactly why. Because today we're going to look at what happens when we're just wearing masks to church. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7 as we get ready to wrap up the Sermon on the Mount. I want you to pay close attention to the words that Jesus says here because these are important words. These are not words that we should just go and walk out the door and ignore. These are not words that we should just forget and, and pass by. These are words that mean the difference between eternal life and eternal damnation. No, I'm not going to go and hold it back today. This is the difference between heaven and hell. And people can go and think what they want to about it. But I'm going to tell you, the whole purpose of the past six months is right here. This is why it's so important to listen to God's word and the message that Jesus brings. Why it's so important to study that word together as Christians and followers in Christ. Read with me if you would. Let's start at verse 15. Verse 15 of Matthew chapter 7. I'll be reading out a New American Standard this morning. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You'll know them by the fruit. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, and every bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, you will know them by their fruit. Now, mark your space there because we're going to come back to that in a minute. Jesus has given a warning. Last week we talked about the difference in the wide path and the narrow path. The wide gate and the narrow gate. We talked about that. Few find that narrow gate. It's hard to find and very few do get to it and get in it. The reason being is because their hearts are in the wrong place. Jesus is continuing that very same thought here as he goes and he presents this and he says that there are all kinds of people who look like Christians, but they're not. That's sad. Isn't that sad? The thing that people are trying to put on Jesus like a mask and then take it off as soon as they get home or around the wrong crowd. 
Beware of false teachers. Beware of those who come to you in sheep's clothing, but they are wolves in their hearts. There are congregations that look like they're doing what's right, but they're not because the gate is narrow and there are many false teachers and prophets about. There are many teachers who look like they love God, but are they listening to the word? Are they teaching the word? Or are they teaching something that is completely outside what scripture says? What are you supposed to do? How are we supposed to know? How can we know if we are attending the right place or not? If we're not, if we're listening to the truth or not? How can you know if somebody's a true teacher? I want you to listen to what Jesus says. First, in verse 16, Jesus says that you will recognize them by their fruits. Healthy trees bear good fruit, and diseased trees bear bad fruit. One of the places I went to a while back, several years ago, I went, and, and we went over to Hinton's Orchard. Now, over at Hinton's, you'll find all sorts of good trees and, and, and wonderful fruit and all sorts of vegetables and produce. You've been over there, you've seen it before, haven't you? It's over there outside of E-Town. There's all sorts of these little orchards over in and around the area. I went over there one time, and I asked them, I said, do you all have any bad trees that come up every now and again like that? They said, oh yeah, sometimes we'll have a tree get a disease, and we have to be quick about it. Because if that tree goes and sits too long, it's going to go and corrupt every tree around it. It's going to spread like a plague. And so what they have to do is they have to go and cut down. They have to cut the vine. The disease vine has to be cut off. They have to go and they have to take it out. They have to go and what do they do with it? Did they go and just put it in a wood pile and just leave it there? No, they burn it immediately. Why? Because they don't want the disease to spread. I want you to tell, I want to tell you something. That's how you know the orchard's good. And that is also how you know that the body of Christ is serving and attending the congregation is good. Because they don't go and they don't take lightly sin and they don't take lightly false teaching. Good hearts produce good fruit. People who are inwardly ravenous wolves will deceive you with their words, but you will know them by their actions who they truly are. The other way to recognize those who are false is given here in verses 21 to 23. I want you to read this with me. Boy, oh boy. This is one everybody likes here. I want you to read these words with me here. Start verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. I want you, if you don't already have this highlighted in your Bible, you need to highlight it today. Verse 22. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you depart from me. You who practice lawlessness. Now, a lot of people say, well, they are doing it for the right reason, aren't they? I mean, they are saying they did it in the name of the Lord. Well, I want you to go back to the very first line of that in verse 22. Now, I want you to look at this. It says in here in verse 21, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter in. Look at the first words that come out in Matthew chapter 7, verse 22. I want you to read this with me. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we? Hey, first problem. Did we? Did we not do this? Here's the problem with we. And more importantly, what we represents in here. We doesn't represent us. 
We represent the meat. That's the problem here. You see, it could, reason, it could very easily be said like this. Lord, Lord, did I not prophesy in your name? And in your name did I not cast out demons or in your name perform many miracles? I did these things. Hmm. Brings a little different context to it, doesn't it? You see, here's the problem with people today. It's all about what I'm doing. How about I put this into more moderate terms? Did I not attend church service? Did I not go and put 10% of my money into the, into the offering? Did I not go and, and volunteer for Sunday school? Did I not serve as an elder? Did I not serve as a deacon? Did I not serve as a preacher? Did I not serve and live and do and blah, 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 and this I did and that I did? You see the problem here? I do. I is not how you get to heaven. He is how you get to heaven. He, Jesus, the only He that matters. Jesus is the only one that matters. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Who will enter the kingdom of heaven? He says it right here. He who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. He doesn't hold back. There are going to be many people who say the right things, who look like they're doing the right thing, who go and grow hundreds and thousands of people in church. you got these great big congregations out there, but you look at what they go and they preach out of the pulpits and what they teach in their Sunday schools, and it is blasphemous. It's disgusting. It's foolish. And it's leading people straight to hell. Now, I know that's something a lot of people don't like hearing. But it's the truth. There are many people today that are going and preaching a false doctrine. That are feet there preaching and teaching that it's okay that we disagree with what Scripture says when it comes to salvation. I've got bad news for you. If God's word says it, we do it. Amen. We don't go and hold back. We don't go and say, well, that's, content. that's, that's secondary doctrine. I don't think heaven and hell is secondary doctrine material. I think the difference between heaven and hell should be your primary interest. And it should be the primary interest of every individual who lives within the church and outside the doors of the church. I know that there are people today that are questioning and wondering, what do I need to do to be saved? This church over here is saying, all i got to do is believe. But this church over here is saying, i got to be baptized. What's the difference? Is there any way I can get to heaven? And then you got another guy in the middle there saying, well, you don't have to go to church. You can just talk to God at home. Let me be frank with people. If the scripture doesn't say it, then that's not how you do it. Scripture does not say you pray your way to heaven. It does not have a sinner's prayer in the entirety of scripture. There is no sinner's prayer found in the Bible. There is nowhere that says baptism only saved. People think that you get reversed, and that's it. I'm here to tell you today, that water ain't going to do nothing for you if you ain't got a heart that's submitted to God. Some people say all you got to do is repent. What do you mean? You don't have to believe in Jesus Christ? All you got to do is turn away your sin? Guys, no! Jesus says what needs to be done. Jesus is blunt about what needs to be done. And here within the scripture, what Jesus is saying is, is that we need to be obeying what the will of the Father is. All throughout this Sermon on the Mount, what have we talked about? We talked about the need to have a righteousness that surpasses the Pharisees and Sadducees. We need to go beyond what we think is acceptable 
and exceed that. Remember what Jesus said? Be perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect. That means you've got to be striving pretty hard to be perfect. Doesn't mean you're made perfect. You're not. You're not perfect. We ain't going to know what perfect is until we get there. Then, as saints in the Almighty's kingdom, we will be perfected because our faith will be fulfilled. We can sure strive to be better. We can sure do better. There are going to be people who look like Christians, speak like Christians, look like Christians. They had Bible classes. They led worship services. But notice what Jesus says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. If somebody is saying that all you've got to do is be saved by grace alone, yes, you are saved by grace alone in one instance, yes. In order to understand what grace is, you have and understand what grace alone means, you have to understand what the word grace means. Grace means you are saved by the very mercy of our Father, who could have cast you into hell but doesn't. But does that mean you go and ignore what God wants to do? No. Just like me. Everybody goes and tells me, well, Robbie. We don't have to follow the word of God just like that. That's, I mean, you, you can believe that you've got to be baptized, but I don't believe that. And I'm still saved. Are you? Let me put it to you this way. Back in 2 Kings chapter 5, a guy named Naaman has leprosy. He is told by a messenger of Elisha that he has to go and dip himself in the river Jordan seven times to cure his leprosy, and he'll be healed. He'll be healed if he does that. You know what? Naaman's first reaction was to get mad about it and start fussing and fuming about how he thought that Elijah, when Elisha would come out of the tent, lay his hand on him and do some kind of uh, newfangled technique to lay hands on him and heal him of his cure and cure him instantaneously without him having to put any effort or anything into it. It would just be done. But that's not how God works. One of his servants came to him and said, he said, Master, Master, if the man of God had come out to you and told you to do some great thing, would you not do it? Go and wash yourself in the river Jordan and be clean. And he did. He went down in that water seven times. And on that seventh time he came up out of that water, he was healed. In fact, he said he had skin of a newborn baby. I don't think that's a coincidence. Isn't it interesting that Jesus in John chapter 3 says that one must be born of water and the Spirit in order to be saved. Me must be born again of water and the Spirit. That water can't do anything without the Spirit of God being involved in it. And so I tell people, no works don't save you. <coughs> Jesus says right here in Matthew chapter 7, works don't save you. The only one who can save you is God himself. And he has already said how this is to be done. And too many times we go and we water it down. We try to go and make it sound easy or palatable for people. And we got preachers that are afraid that they're going to lose their jobs because, oh my goodness, I may have to preach the truth on Sunday. This baptism saves you. That's kind of big stuff. I don't know what to do. How am I not going to preach the truth? And they get nervous. And then they go and they tell them, they say, oh, I ain't going to talk about that. I don't want to talk about that part of it. Guys, we have to talk about salvation. We have to talk about what's needed. We can't go and ignore this principle that so many people today are blinded by this once saved, always saved nonsense. We've got to stand up and say no more. The Bible says that if you preach this kind of doctrine and you're practicing lawlessness, is it surprising to you 
We live in such a pluralist society which says that you can go to any church and there are a hundred different ways to get to God. And that if you generally are a good person or something like that, or you do so many good works that you're going to get to heaven. There are many people who are false teachers that try to take you off the narrow path. I am here to tell you, friends, stay on the narrow path. Let's find the narrow gate together. Let's do this at the body of Christ and let's invite others to be a part of that truth. Let them see the truth, not just in the words that's being preached from the pulpit, but in the way we are living our lives. What does Jesus tell us we need to do? He says, follow the will of the Father. Why would Jesus tell them he doesn't know if they're lawless people? They are confessing the Lord after all. They're professing and they're prophesying in his name. They're doing all these mighty works, but yet why would he call them workers of lawlessness? Jesus does not know them because they're lawless. They're lawless. Sin separates us from God. To be full of sin is to be lawless. Simply break down that phrase. The works that they are doing are without God's backing. They might be done in the name of God. They may be done in the image of God. They may be done and said, hey, we're doing this for Jesus' name. But they're actually not doing it for Jesus. They're doing it for their glory. They're doing it for me. You see, it's like, why are we what? We did this in your name. We did that in your name. Just like I said before, I've done this in your name. I've done that in your name. That does not get you into heaven because this is how God works. All religions do not lead to God. All denominations do not lead to God. All religions do not lead to God. Not even all the churches of Christ and the Christian churches can lead you to God. All churches do not lead to God. Not even all those Christian churches and churches of Christ out there that say we've got the only way there. Yeah. And so I have to warn the Christian churches and churches of Christ are your preachers teaching what the word says? Or are they going and afraid to preach what the word says because the leadership is afraid of what the word says? There's a lot of churches today that have got that issue. I'm not going to point fingers. I don't have to point fingers. Why? Because Jesus says they'll be known by their fruit. If you're a young preacher, and I say this to any of the preachers out there, young preachers, older preachers that are looking for churches, all of them, if you see any of these things going on in those congregations or hear about these fruits that are, these rotten fruit that are hanging around in there, and they hear about these things, get out of the way. Get out of there. A lot of people say, well, shouldn't a preacher go in there and try to fix it? Yeah, it'd be nice if we could. But if the leadership has already decided what's going to be preached from the pulpit, then I've got bad news for you. There ain't no fixing it. Well, he works for the church. He has to listen to us. Nobody put an elder or deacon in charge of the church if Jesus is in charge of the church. And no elder or deacon should be telling the preacher what to preach. Amen. The word of God should tell the preacher what to preach. I hate that so many churches today are going and watering down this faith. And the problem is there are preachers today that are watering down this faith that are going and falling into this trap too. And it's not because these preachers are just bad and wicked people. No. They just want to see people come to Christ. They want to see people come to Jesus or their picture of Jesus. And what they do is they go and they say, well, all you 
got to do is believe. And people come in and come in and come in and come in and come in. And boy, they'll come in by the hundreds and the boatloads. All you got to do is believe. I don't have to be bad nice. I don't have to change my life. I don't have to do anything. All I have to do is believe. And thousands are being falling into that trap today. We must act within the authority of God's word. We must act within the authority of scriptures. There are, te- there are churches and congregations today that teach sexual immorality is acceptable. We're not one of them. There are people today that think that you can go and have as many wives or as many husbands as you want or you can go and have whatever kind of relationship you want outside the doors of the church. But that the church should accept you for that. No, that's not true. There are churches that teach that adultery is acceptable. That's not true. There are churches that refuse to pass judgment on sinful behaviors. That's not true either. There are churches that teach that divorce for any reason is acceptable. This is not one of those congregations. There are churches that teach that promiscuity is tolerable. No, it isn't. If God don't like it, neither do we. The churches are to emphasize the truth of God's word. The problem is that there are churches that do not emphasize the word of God and thus saith the Lord, but instead are more concerned about tickling the ears and the wallets of other people to make them comfortable. Let me tell you something. If I got fired tomorrow and said, well, I'm going to get fired, I'd still be free. But if Steve said there ain't no money left, we've gone dry. We have no money left. Guess what I'd be doing? I'd still be in the pulpit. I'd say, you can I still preach? Yeah, you can still preach. We just can't pay you. Okay. Why? Because money isn't the matter. I don't care. You know what I want that money to go to? I want the money to go to the lost. I want the money to go to the saved that are being built up and edified in the body of Christ. I want to help those brothers and sisters in Christ who need that word, need that money, who are facing hardships, who are facing troubles, and practice good benevolence, and reach out to those that are hungry, those that are sick, those that are widowed, to go out and fund missionaries, to be able to take care of the people and the young people and the old people. Anybody that needs to hear the gospel message needs to be able to hear it, see it, believe it, and know it in their hearts, and we need to be able to fund it. And so many people today are afraid of the poor. Even churches today, well, let's increase the amount of songs we sing and shorten the amount of preaching we have. Someone is not reading Romans chapter 10 very good. How will they know if there is someone there, if there's not someone there to tell them? How will they hear unless someone is there speaking the truth? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the words. We need to hear the word. And that's what Jesus is saying. We must have a spiritual intensity about us because the gate is narrow. If you find it. Now, I know there's a lot of people out there that say, I'm going to make a lot of people mad. I realize I'm going to make a lot of people mad. But you know what Jesus said? You're going to make a lot of people mad. That's why. That's why he said you're going to get persecuted. You're going to get knocked out left and right. You're going to have people yelling and screaming at you because of that. It's not my problem. Let them be mad. If they're mad at me for preaching the truth, I'm sorry. Jesus said to do it, and I will live by it. And I hope you will too. Because we need to have a spiritual intensity. We must have spiritual intensity about what we're going to do and what we're going to teach. Because there are false teachers out there that look like they love people, that look like they love the Lord, but they are wolves and they are in it for themselves. We must have spiritual intensity because Jesus just said that even people who say, Lord, Lord, I do all these good works. Yeah, they're still going to fall short. Friends, this should make perfect sense to us. 
Jesus did not give this sermon so that people would think that whoever comes to Jesus is fine. Jesus taught some of us the most important lessons, the hardest lessons we can in this section right here from Matthew chapter 5 to Matthew chapter 7 are some of the hardest, most diligent, deepest rooted word that we can get into in all of Scripture. And yet so many of us just pass it along, read it on, and say, well, I don't think any more about it. That's not what Jesus says we need to do. Jesus says we need to get real about it. He goes and he talks from anger, lust, judging, loving others, forgiving others, trusting God. We have seen how the narrow gate is the only way to get to heaven. How can we possibly be surprised to know that there are actually people that are going to end up going to hell? There are a lot of people that just go and say, well, God loves everybody. God will never send his children to hell. Yes, he would. Why? Because he's not sending them there. They're sending themselves there. God is not going to do anything that you don't want done. If you don't want to live in heaven with him, he ain't going to let you live in heaven with him. If you want to be a slave to sin, guess what? You can be a slave to sin, but you're not coming into heaven. But I thought if I was a sinner, I could be saved. That's what the preacher said. You believe everything the preacher says? Did you back it up with scripture? Did you actually live with what the scripture says? Did you actually spend time with Jesus? Did you actually spend time with the Lord? If you did, then you'd be like the wise builder. You know that verse, don't you? That's here in verses 24 to 29. Read those with me. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against the house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act upon them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the wind blew and slammed against the house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Who are wise people? Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like the wise man. Go back and read Matthew chapter 5 and Matthew chapter 7 again. Read it. And this time, don't just read it and go over it and say, well, that's nice and all. Actually, read and see what it says we got to do. Read it. You've got to apply what God says to be different. Otherwise, you're like the foolish person. The foolish person hears these words and says, oh, well, I'll just keep doing what I'm doing. If you keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect different results, that's the definition of insanity. It's also the definition of being a sinner that's not saved by grace. Do you hear and do what Jesus says? Or do we just hear? We must not disregard God's word. We must not ignore what Jesus is teaching. How amazing it is that this is exactly what happens. We have a choice. There is the way to life that's, e that's not easy and it's hard to find. And then there's the path to destruction, which is why full of people and going and continuing that way throughout until Jesus returns. The ways of God are not to follow your heart or your desires. The way of God is to listen to what Jesus says and then do it. The poor in spirit, the pure in heart, the meek and humble, the ones who hunger and thirst for righteousness are the blessed in the kingdom. Now, we can see why the crowds were astonished. As it says here in verse 28, when Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one as had authority and not as their scribes. These words challenged them, and I pray, I pray that today these words challenge you too. Build your house on the rock. Hear the words of Jesus and do it. Take the
They never pass the life and enter into the narrow gates. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Jesus says it is foolish to hear the words and ignore them and still build your life on anything other than the rock of Jesus Christ. It matters how we live. It matters how we worship. It matters how we teach and what we teach others. This is our spiritual lives at stake. We must have an intensity for the outcome of our souls and for the souls of others. Be wise. Build your house on the rock. This morning, if you've got a decision in your heart, if you've got a decision in your heart, don't just listen to what the preacher says. Listen to what the Word of God says. Hear the word and apply it. Hear the word and be changed. Hear the word and be different. This morning, if you've got a decision in your heart, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. Not because Robbie says, not because the Christian church says, or the church of Christ says, but because Jesus says right here in the word. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe will be damned. I can't put it any blunter than that. That's what he said, not me. You can believe all you want to. Unless you're willing to do something about it, it isn't going to do you a bit of good. It isn't going to do you a bit of good. Get right with Jesus today. Follow Jesus. Be real. Tell others about it.